forward time, right? Now, what's the recommended amount of time for ABA therapy? At least 40 hours a week. Now, you got a child who, when all his friends are out having fun in the summer, they're in therapy. They're also maybe taking speech therapy, occupational therapy, and all that time and work they're doing hmm. not getting overtime. And that can cause that hopeless complex and the development delays. Most kids develop in a linear fashion. They learn how to tie their shoes. They learn a few words at a time, and then they're speaking in sentences, in paragraphs. Autism is different. We're more like a jack and buck. Dun, 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 dun. You're trying all kinds of things. Nothing seems to be working. And pop all of a sudden, they're speaking in sentences and paragraphs. And now you wish they were not verbal. They're talking so much. And that's how my linear process was. I was in intense speech therapy all the way from age two to age 16. When I was seven years old, my speech was so delayed. My brother Chuck would meet, introduce me to people saying, you need to meet my brother Ron. I think he's from Norway. And he had me talk and no one knew what he, I was saying. So they thought he was an expert in Norwegian languages. But a lot of times our development being delayed like that can make us um, feel hopeless. When I was 30 years old, I had my master's degree. Um, the economy went down. Remember in 2004, 2005, and I found myself making five fifty an hour Corky's skate shop, even though I had a master's degree. And my grandpa said this to my mom, my grandpa Olmstead, my mom's dad. Sometimes life has a way of overlooking certain people like Ron. It was before I was married. And my mom said this, Ron's time to shine, like the phoenix rises out of the ashes, hasn't yet come. But you watch, you'll see it someday. And the sad thing is that he died two years before I got my contract to my first book at 89 years old. But my grandpa and grandma were famous mystery writers. My grandpa did all the research. My grandma was a writer. Remember in the 80s, they had a game called Clue? Well, my grandma did and marketed, is she marketed the idea of Clue doing live plays, mystery plays where they'd have a dinner and then they'd have the play. And she published three nationally published books. When she died, I got a book that was signed from Stephen King, who she knew and a bunch of other ones. She was even on Good Morning America and Regis referred to as a homicide grandma. What ended up, happening, ended up happening after, after they, passed they passed on is my mom, my mom noticed, noticed something. something. I, was I was speaking to, to big, big audiences, audiences at Dearborn, Dearborn Inn. Inn. I spoke, I spoke at, at Weber's, Weber's and Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor. Frank and Frank Mrs. Mrs. keynote speaker to a few, few hundred, hundred, hundred people. people. And, and she, noticed she noticed that my audiences, audiences were, were bigger than the ones grandma and grandpa had in those murder mysteries they had in the same place. And she said, you know, you know grandpa, grandpa said her life overlooked you, but he didn't realize with autism, delays don't mean denials. It just makes, it takes you longer to accomplish those things. But when you're going through delays and you're seeing everyone else accomplish these things and you're going through all this, sometimes you start to lose hope. Even as when I was younger, I started to feel that way. And every milestone and major event in my life took me longer than my peers and brothers. I graduated from high school at age 20. People wanted me to be held back one more year so I could be the designated buyer, not driver. I was 35 years old before I had a long-term relationship. 36 when I moved out of my parents' home. So if your kid's still living at home and he's older on the spectrum, don't worry. Their time to shine just hasn't yet come. I was 37 when I got married. And I got married on December 7th, three history buffs. That's the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And having all of I came in like a kamikaze, a whirlwind of fire. I was 41 when I became a father, 42 when my first book was published, 46 for my third book, Views from the Spectrum, A Window of Life and Faith in Neurodivergent Child. Notice every one of my developments, they have way later in life. Then my peers, my brother Chuck, who's only a year older than me, 
He was already married 15 years by the time I got married. My brother Steve, who um, is eight years older than me, he was already married two decades by the time I got married. So I can understand where my grandpa Homestead said, sometimes it looks like life overlooks people. But that belief in your child can create hope. My mom never allowed me to go give up. She was always there. She still always is there for me, encouraging me every step of the way. And Dylan Balk, there's a picture of him, and he's what most women would consider a good-looking guy. And yet he struggles in life because of autism. And anyone know the difference between Asperger's and high-functioning autism? Here's the difference. There's only one difference. And I'm considered now high-functioning autism, not Asperger's because of it. Remember I mentioned I had a speech delay from age two to 16. So if there's a speech delay, then it's high functioning autism. If there's no speech delay, then it's Asperger's. And with Dylan, he also had that speech delay. So we call him high functioning autism. And again, he has a dad, Derek, who not only believed in Dylan, but he marketed Dylan. And now Dylan does all these comedy shows and. Texas and California, and he's well known. He has two nationally published books that his dad and him wrote together. Very cool guy, but you got to hear him describe this hopeless complex because he experienced the same thing and he puts it more eloquently. Dylan, offer a bad choice and make good stories. Title alone makes you want to buy this book, and it's a great book, one of the best books I've read. My life is such a minefield of failures. No matter how hard I try, and I try really hard, can't keep a job, can't keep a girl, can't even keep track of my belongings, for God's sakes. Even with my perpetual optimism, everything in life tends to go wrong, more wrong than I ever thought it could. I feel like my optimistic nature is being slowly and painfully eroded by my increasingly soul-crushing life experiences. And there's the hopeless complex. Soul-crushing life experiences. It makes you dried up. Those dogs, when they learned hopelessness, they lost their drive, drive move, move because, because they thought, they thought nothing's, gonna nothing's gonna change. change. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of times young adults young would alternate, like, nothing's, like, nothing's gonna change. change. Why should, why I, should I, I try? And that's, that's why praise, praise is a powerful, powerful motivation. motivation. We're gonna see in a few minutes. There's, There's Dr. Dr. Tony, Tony Atwood. Atwood. He's, He's a, a top, top expert, expert on, on autism, autism and Asperger's, Asperger's in, in the world, world for um, Australia. I got to present with him. And he said it this way. 80% of people with autism suffer from depression or anxiety during their life. What happens with anxiety is you miss out on opportunities. And most kids with autism and young adults with autism, and I was like this for years until I turned 40 and I learned how to do it. They're like Velcro shoes that are 30 years old. What happened to Velcro shoes that you're wearing for 10 years? They have no ability to connect. And a lot of times, People with autism, they don't learn how to connect. They're like those old Velcro shoes. And what happens with anxiety is it gets so built up, you don't see in the present all the opportunities around you. You don't see, um, you don't all, see the all the connections around you. Around you. When, when I was in college, I had, I had high anxiety. anxiety. I, thought I, had I had to graduate, graduate, with, a graduate with a 4.0, 4 which, 4 .0, which I did. But it added anxiety, and I missed and I out on a lot of opportunities around, around me. me. And I had to and learn how to market and learn how to get those opportunities. And there's a guy named Dr. Wiseman who wrote a great book called The Luck Factor. It's a New York Times bestselling book. And he interviewed... 150 people, people who said, said they're the luckiest, luckiest people in the world. They, they make connections all the time. All uh, they, they end up on TV or reality TV shows. And he interviewed 150 who said they're the worst lucky person in the world. It's a sunny day and yet they slip on ice and break their leg. So he decided he was going to find out what's the difference between lucky people who claim luck and unlucky people. So he had 150 of the people, people who say, say they're the luckiest, luckiest people, people in the world, and the 150 who are the most um, pessimistic people in the world and say they have bad luck. And he had them walk to 
uh, um, coffee shop, and he said, you're going to meet a great connection when you get there. If you're lucky, if you're unlucky, you're not going to meet him. That wasn't Tess at all. Tess was there was a $20 bill on the ground. Of the 150 people who said that they were lucky, 80% of them found that $20 bill. Of the unlucky people, only 20% found it. So he knew it wasn't luck. He knew there was something different. So he did a psychological anal analysis of all 300 of them. He found out this. The ones who found the $20 bill, they experienced a lot less anxiety in life. They were living in the moment. They're going there. They're not thinking about when I get home, I have to do this project. When I get home at work, I got this. They were in the moment and they found it. But the ones who were anxious, they were thinking about all these things going on in their head, even things that they have no control over. The weather, um, whether um, their job's going to be secure. And those ones missed out. People with autism, if they're experiencing that severe anxiety, 80%. They're missing out on those opportunities around them because they're so focused on everything else. And when I was in college, I was so focused on academics. I was so focused on would I meet the right person and all these other things that I missed out on a lot of opportunity. Every day for my first year in college, I sat next to someone on my sister wing. And you know what they ended up becoming? A New York Times bestselling author. And then I missed out on that. You know why? So I was so focused on all these other things. I could have learned more marketing skills, learned more how to connect. For um, my second year of grad school, every night I was sleeping next to a guy. In fact, this close, because the was there. And his name's Joel Merritt. He's uh, now the most wealthy guy in all of Tampa. He developed a company called... Um, Nutrients, it's um nutrients trust, and it sells more supplements online. Bionutrients trust, that's what it is. Bionutrient trust. It sells more nutrients supply online than any company in the world. And um he um was able to market himself. And but what I was so focused on academics, I was like that old pair of velcros. I didn't really connect. And then he ended up writing. Before he became successful as a businessman, a book called The Myth of Eating After 7 p.m. Anyone ever hear of that? The book sold 1.5 million copies. And I didn't even make that connection. And for years, I'd tell the story about how he said he was going to win Body for Life. And then he ended up winning Body for Life. And I, would, I was so pessimistic at the time. I kept telling him, you're not going to win Body for Life. And then the year after he dropped out of ORU, I get an email and he tells me he won Body for Life. And it's a picture of him on the book and all the awards he won. But I was unable to connect because I had all that anxiety. And if one of the things is that... We can, we can learn, learn to help, to help our, our kids' anxiety, anxiety go down, down learn how to teach them to enjoy life more, not be anxious. We're going to connect a lot better. And now I have opportunities coming and going because I've learned how to keep my anxiety down. That's why I get a call from the producer of um, Travel on the Spectrum and wanting to interview me. But when I was younger, I never got those. And I've missed out on a lot of things. Deborah, whose son has Asperger's, wrote, I'm convinced that the greatest gift we can give our differently wired kids is a knowledge of who they are, how their brains work, and what they need to do to create the life they want. Because when we guide our children along the path of self-discovery, they can feel good about themselves, develop self-advocacy skills, and ultimately grow to be Self-realized adults. That's who it is. Self-realized adults. Remember Maslow's triangle or pyramid? What's the highest level? Self-actualization. And for a person with autism to reach there, they got to know how their brain works. They got to know that they're going to have 80% more anxiety and depression than other people because their brain processes things much differently. One of the ways our brain processes things different is most people, their short-term memory is back here. What happens when you sleep and you get that REM sleep, it goes from your short-term memory to your frontal lobe where your long-term memory is located. 
So, so what happens when it does that is it learns along the way. So it has all this information of things that happen during the day. And as it goes from the short term to long term, it generalizes it. But with autism, we have a difficulty generalizing things because most information we take in, we're great with small details because it stays here, but it's more a crystallized memory rather than a liquid memory where you can use it. Liquid memory is like riding a bike. No matter how old you get, you remember how to ride a bike. Even if you have um, a brain injury, you'll still be able to ride that bike or play music. Usually that part is liquid memory. But with us on the autism spectrum, we're more like blockbuster videos. Wow, what a difference. Or 10,000 videos. We see things exactly detail for detail as if it's a video when we're watching it which makes it a lot harder for us to respond to information. And I was reminded of this, Michaela, um, when she was in kindergarten, they um, told the kids what to do if a dangerous person comes in the school. And one night she's sleeping and she starts crying real loud. And I thought she was having night tear. We wake her up and we said, what's wrong? And she says, there's three bad guys at grandma's house. And I started to think, what were you watching? Were you watching Home Alone? What would cause this? And then when I took her to my mom's house, her grandma's house, I told her and she said, you see, yesterday they learned in school what to do if a bad guy came in. And they only mentioned one bad guy. You know why she saw three? Because when it was going from her short-term memory to her long-term memory, she was learning, she was generalizing. If there's one bad guy, there can be two bad guys, there can be three bad guys. With autism, usually, we just remember that bad guy. We have huge amount of anxiety. We'd see that bad guy as a very particular type, very detailed, instead of learning from it and being able to process it and being able to respond to it. But when we realize how our brains work, then we can start realizing our kryptonites, weaknesses, and learn how to respond appropriately to those information. And a healthy self-efficiency is key to overcoming hopeless conflict. Self-efficiency is a person's person belief in their ability, ability to execute, to execute the action the actions necessary to achieve desired, desired outcomes. outcomes. And that's, and that's the opposite, opposite of hopeless, hopeless conflict. conflict. Hopeless conflict thinks, thinks I'm not going to be, gonna be able, able to do it. Self-efficiency means, self -efficiency means I, know I know I can do it. Do it. I just need I just the right steps and I'll do it. And with all to we have difficulty putting those steps in order to be able to achieve the things we need to achieve. One of the things that helped me a lot is my parents had two different views of education. My mom's, my mom's view was, was we do everything, we do everything to, help to help our kid, our kid learn, learn those skills. skills. We do every, we do every resource, resource we use. We use. My, dad's my dad's theory was, theory was you throw them in deep, deep water, water to learn to, learn to swim. swim. And actually, and actually both, both of them actually, actually helped. Help. So, so at age, age 10, 10, he had me, he had out, me out there mowing, mowing the lawn, lawn learning, learning the skills of how to mow the lawn. Age 14, I got my first job. And for you older folks, I got it in God's waiting room. Bill Knapp's restaurant. It looked, it looked like, like a funeral home, home from the outside. outside. On your birthday, they gave you a chocolate cake. They, um, the average clientele was 70 plus years old because on their birthday, they got a discount off their bill based on their age. And it helped me learn skills, like how to manage money, how to deal with array customers, how to be able to interact with coworkers. My dad had a three prong rule of money. First 10% goes to God or charity, tithing. Second 10% goes to the savings in the bank. And third percent, which is 80%, goes to getting the things you want. But he had another rule with that, is when you were going to get a pair of shoes, if you're going to get something nice like a New Balance, you didn't have to pay the whole price. Like Bill Knapps, he had his own discount, like Applebee's two for 20. And his discount was this. You went first to pay less. You saw the price of the shoes that were equivalent to the ones you wanted, minus the pay less from the price of your own shoes that you want, the brand name, whether Jordans or New Balance or Nike, and then you knew how much you had to take out of that 80% you made. And by doing that, you taught those social skills. When I was going to go decide I wanted to go to Old Roberts University, it was 950 miles away. He got on an airplane with me. Remember, I said, someone believes in you. My dad believed in me. He flew me out to Tulsa. He went around to all the classrooms. He showed me around the campus and said, if you really want to go here, 
we're going to back you. But your first year, you got to get that, take that full ride you got for track and cross country to what is now Rochester University. And I went there, got my grades up, got a high scholarship for Oral Roberts University. And then when I, my first semester there as a sophomore, he didn't just have me get in an airplane, fly out there. He flew out there with me. He showed me where all the classes were I'd be taking. He helped me sign up for those classes. And he introduced me to the residence advisor. He introduced me to a chaplain on my floor and said, these are the people who are going to help you. These are the things you need to do because he believed in me. Then he helped me mark and say, you know, this is the area you need to work on. And both of them combined, they had different philosophies, but they worked together and they were in sync with each other. And it's good for your partner to be in sync with you and understand autism. And Julie, whose teenage daughter, Lizzie, has autism, says, love a child exactly as she is. We often think we need to fix children with autism, but in actuality, we need to learn how their minds work and use their strengths to help them become the best version of themselves. Also keep them marathon mindset. As a parent or worker, we want to do everything possible to help our kids, but we ourselves burn out. When we forget to take care of ourselves, our kids can feel our stress, slow down and remember the little steps of progress will add up. So it's important to understand autism, as much resources, resources, you resources you can get. You get look at those, those resources. There's a saying about autism. autism. You meet one, one kid with autism, autism you met one. one. One, one kid with autism, autism, we're all very different. different. I'm very, very unique, unique with autism. autism. And a lot of times, times too, when I fly, I'm going to be flying to Georgia and doing three breakout sessions at a big conference. conference. When, when I fly, fly I always I have always to pre-board pre -board because, board of because of what? that anxiety. anxiety. What, if what if they don't they have room overhead for my books? What if I'm prairie pump and honey badger in my backpack? I don't have room for them. So I always pre-board. And you know what a lot of people tell me? They say, they say you don't, you don't look, look autistic. autistic. All you, you got to do for that is have a styrofoam cap, put it on your head, and they'll let you write on. on. And they have no more questions. I got a uh, beach hat that I wear, and I bring it when I travel. Just put that hat on. I don't have to worry. Now I look autistic. I guess they have a way of looking autistic. But understanding autism makes people not say a common like that. But a lot of people don't understand autism. And you got to take, take care, care of yourself. Of yourself. Every, Every day, day, I do 30 push-ups push before I go to bed. bed. I take, take my vitamins. vitamins. And, and sleep, sleep is the number one way you take care of yourself. yourself. When you sleep, you have yes, cell division. division. When you sleep, your body produces insulin. When, when you sleep, sleep, your body doesn't produce cortisone that makes your blood, blood pressure, pressure go up. up. It monitors its heart rate. Heart rate. So, so sleep, sleep is the best, best thing you can do for self-care. Eight to nine hours, you have three REM um, phases of sleep, and then your brain will be refreshed. And even our memory, our um, creativity, all that takes place when we sleep. So that's what I recommend for that. But when you have a kid with autism, you know what? It's hard to sleep. Their sleeping cycle, again, it's more like the jack in the box rather than that linear sleep. So a lot of times you lack sleep. But finding ways to relax is important. Number two, focus on abilities and refining talents. And there's my mom with me. There's Miss Michelle. And notice what do I have in my hand? I got animals. And one of the things my mom did is she marketed Prairie Pup. He was here. And Prairie Pup, in 2002, he met Muhammad Ali in Washington, D.C., and I had a friend, and he saw my talents, he saw my gifts. Remember I said successful people see successful people, and they see things with a vision that we can't always see, and I have a friend, Dave Harden, one of the most successful people I know, and when I was in college, he saw my ability to quote the scriptures, and he loved it. I had over 50, over 50 I still I do, I had over 15,000 15, verses memorized, and we, and we saw, saw that, that gift, gift kind of took me under his wing. And then, and then in, in 2002, 2002, I get a phone, I get a phone call, call, and it's Dave. He said, I'm going to fly you out to Washington, D.C. You're going to meet Muhammad Ali. Ali. You're going to meet, meet Roberta Flack. Flack. And he named about, about 20 famous people. people. And he, he said, said, this is in memory of the families of September 11th. 
It's, it's um, American Heroes, and I'm in charge of this organization. So we're flying out. In 2012, we met, we met streets from Saved, Saved by the Bill. The, Bill. the most, most interesting, interesting place, Prairie Pup's been, been. It, wasn't it wasn't Israel when I went to Israel. It wasn't Madagascar. It was up the nose of the booger from Revenge of the Nerds. I met Kurt Armstrong at Oakland University. And I said, can you put your finger up your nose and take a prayer picture with Prairie Pup? So I'll take it to the next level. I'll shove that little animal up my nose and he can burrow up there for a minute. And sure enough, he shoved Prairie Pup up his nose. But my mom saw those interests, she saw those talents, and she used them. She noticed something also when I write my name. I write my name in my favorite book, This Falling Apart. How did I write my name? Backwards. So a lot of times your kids with autism or your grandkids with autism, they're not only going to have autism, they're going to have learning challenges because our brain processes information differently. And if we don't process information, we don't teach the way our brains process information, we're not going to be able to learn. And my mom noticed I had a great visual ability. When I was five years old, these are copies of my drawing. She noticed that I had a great ability to draw. I drew these at 85. So what she had me do is tell her a story. She'd write down the story. I'd rewrite the story from her writing. And how am I learning now, visually? Only 5% of people with autism can learn phonetically. The biggest scam in US history, it wasn't Enron. It wasn't the Bernie Mac scam. It was hooked on phonics because no kid would... Autism, very few can learn phonetically. And within two years of her teaching me the way my brain processes information, now how am I writing my name? I'm writing, writing it, it right. right. The dyslexia, dyslexia went away, went away because, because she was she teaching me the way I learned. Learn. And we got to be, be able to focus, focus on, on those, those talents, talents and refine them. them. She, she knew, knew my talent was what? Art. So she used art. She knew my talent was knowledge of animals. So she used that prairie dog to teach me. And um, there's Temple Grandin. I present with her three times, once in person, twice online. And in special education, there's too much emphasis placed on the deficit and not enough on the strength. And there's her. She looks like she just saw the burning bush. She always looks like that. I did an article for Charisma Magazine to publish my first book. And it went out to 5 million subscribers. And it was a four page article. But before they publish it, I get an email from the editor. Did Temple Grand to give you permission to use her picture? I'm like, yes. And then I get the email back. And how come it looks like you just took a shot? And I said, she's very consistent with her um, photos. And I send them on everyone. She's just like that. And I, and said, I said, that's, that's autistic, autistic facial, expression. facial expression. And when she and when met she my met prairie dog, dog, she said, that, ah, ah, prairie dog, we shoot him, him out here out west. west. He's, He's in, in my, my cattle. cattle. We wouldn't get good cows for McDonald's. <laughs> that honey badger. He's a badass. I don't think I could train him. I train all kinds of animals. So see, you like my um, mascots. Brewery Doc thought he was going to get shot that day. <laughs> Other than that, that's pretty, that's pretty good. good. So, so my mom, mom believed in autism, autism refined, refined, not cured. Autism, autism can be refined, be refined it can't, can't be cured. I can't, can't cough, cough on, on you today, today and you get, get the, the autism, autism flu or, or the autism, autism version of COVID. But, but autism, autism can, can be refined. Autism unrefined looks like this. this. You're walking on the hot black pavement to go to Lake Michigan or the ocean. I know I was out there right now. We probably wish we were in the ocean and out there on a nice sunny beach in Florida. And as you're walking in the parking lot barefoot, you feel something sharp. You go down, you pick it up, it's a piece of glass. Someone is having Miller time. Now you're having tetanus shot time. It's jagged, it's rigid. Austin Munn refined for me was little ability to filter what I'd say. Thought came in my mouth, I spewed out, I was like, Trump on Twitter. But I can just deny it now because they didn't have Twitter back then. Autism unrefined was like a very little ability to control my emotions. I just 
went off when sensory issues started to happen in my life. My favorite autism unrefined moment happened in 1996. I was going to college my first year at Rochester University, which was then Michigan Christian College. And I was working at a car wash. And on the way to work that day, they announced on 97 won the ticket. Today, Wayne Fonts was fired. He had the best running back all time in Barry Sanders, a great wide receiver in Herman Moore, and a great quarterback in Scott Mitchell's. And they had number one offense and didn't make the playoffs. So as I'm drying out those cars at the car wash across from Oakland University, who should show up there in a white Jaguar with a Cuban cigar tightly knit between his lips? Wayne Fonz. So I start drying off his car, and I notice the kids who work there, they all have pen and paper. They're getting his autograph. If I go in the back, I kid you not, you look just like this when I hand him the paper. Son, is that what I think it is? I said, yes, Wayne, that's a job application. They announced today on 97 won the ticket, you were fired. See that fly there? That's defense. I can teach you a little defense to get you back in the NFL again. And he drove off shaking his head and didn't say a word. Last year, I'm walking out on the unit of the hospital I work at, and someone comes up to me and he says this. He goes, um, did you go to Little Roberts University? Did you, Did you used to work, work at a car wash? And I thought, I thought he was going to say, I heard your presentation. But he says, I was a manager that day. day. You yeah. handed Fonz that job application. So even 20 years later, he still remembered the person we saw. Now, all to the refined looks like this. You're off that hot black pavement. You're walking along Lake Michigan, the ocean. All of a sudden, you feel something on your foot. Feels good. Din, din. I knew that it would. So good. I got it made. Din, din, din. It's a piece of glass. When it was refined by something greater than itself, it was refined by the ocean. It was refined by ABA therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, learning social skills. Now, that piece of glass, you don't throw out, afraid you're going to get cut. Put it on your neck, it's jewelry. You put it on a wall as art. And that's what my mom was determined to do for me. She was inspired by a proverb. Proverb 22, 29 said, do you see a man skilled in his labor? You'll serve before kings and not obscure men. She knew if she could use my gifts, refine my gifts, I'd serve before kings and not obscure men. And when I was in kindergarten, they had a two-teacher rule. You had one teacher in front of the class, one at the back, the one in the front made sure you didn't go out the front door. One in the back made sure you didn't go out the back door. And my mom said, you're not educating the kids you're babysitting. The best he's going to be is bagging groceries. The best he's going to be is a, a bellboy holding doors opener, washing dishes. But he's got these great talents. I'm going to refine those talents and he'll serve before kings and not obscure men. And Dr. Karen Clark and me and her do a lot of events. Um, development days at high schools will go and present. And we do ones at large churches like Kensington, Brightmore Christian, where we work with the security teams of the church and teach them about people who are neurodiverse and how to respond if a person's having a meltdown. You're working security. And she has a son on the autism spectrum. She says this, I don't want to turn an autistic person into a non-autistic person. I want to help an autistic person who struggles become an autistic person who does not struggle as much. We're going to always struggle some. Even typical people who are not on the spectrum, they struggle. Life is hard and on us. Can't always make good lemonade. And number three, be created. And there's Cheddar Squirrel. One of the ways my mom was created, creative is she'd have we get the letters in 1982 from Cheddar the Squirrel, and they had social skills. One is like Cheddar loves to talk, but Scampy, his good friend, loves to listen. And more squirrels are hanging out with Scampy, who listens. And she had listens underlined in the letter because we on the spectrum have difficulty with that. And every week she'd send me another letter from Cheddar the Squirrel, and this helped me learn those social skills. So you got to be creative. Each kid, it's different. If they can't learn the way we teach, we teach the way they learn. And as I mentioned, we don't learn good phonetically. 
If you want a kid to do something on the spectrum, use pictures. Remember, picture education cards that help the kid learn how to use the bathroom or how to learn to tie your shoes. A lot of times, all of them you learn a lot better visually than phonetically. Temple Grandin estimates that 80% of all people with autism are visual learners. So when I was in high school, I had to take Spanish and I got a D in it. And that was only by the grace of Miss Sober, Sober the Spanish, Spanish teacher. Spanish then I got, then I got in, college, in college, I had to take, and I had to take Koine, Koine Greek, Greek, the biblical, biblical Greek that the, the, the New Testament's, Testament's written, written in. in. And I got and a 4.0. 4 I, I took an extra year of it because, because I was so, so good, good at it. And I've been teaching Greek now for 20 years as a professor. professor. There's one big key difference. I go to Spain or Mexico. Mexico. What are they speaking? Spanish. If, if I, I go, go to Greek, you know what they're, they're speaking? Not Koine Greek. Greek. They're, they're speaking modern Greek. Greek. And a dead language, you can't teach phonetically. You, you got to teach it visually. So, so every, every time, time I learn my words, whether it's agape, um, unconditional, unconditional love, they didn't tell me, they wouldn't pronounce it. They'd have it written out there and they'd say, this is a Greek word for love. And they didn't pronounce it. And they have you put them on note cards. Then you had to learn the, the syntax of the language. You had to learn parsing. And they were all rules of grammar that aren't like English, where we have all of a sudden you have mouse and you have mice, where it's two different words. Greek is a very simple language. It follows very simple rules. So I was able to master it and translate two-thirds of the New Testament from Greek into English because they taught it the way... I learned. When they taught Spanish the way I didn't learn, I didn't learn. And one of the things one of my teachers told my mom when I was in second grade, they said, well, teach Ron 50% visually and 50% phonetically. And then my mom said they don't want to get a 50% education because there's no way his brain can process that information the way you want them to process it. And one of my teachers, Miss Milne, she used my special interest and prairie dogs to help teach me. She'd use them. She'd have me tell a story and share with the class of the Adventures of Prairie Pup. And they had a contest in the 1980s, and it was called the Detroit Edison Poster Contest. In Detroit Edison, their commercial was this. It was Isaiah Thomas with a little kid, and Isaiah would be like, look up. Kid looks up, and he says, I don't see anything. I said, good, there's no electrical wires. So my poster showed was Prairie Pup, building a fort near electrical wires. There's a squirrel and he's about to hit a transmitter and it says this, look up, you don't want to become a furry fried friend. And it won first prize, Prairie Pup got to meet his first celebrity, Isaiah Thomas. And the teachers used that interest, but they knew those interests because my mom had already marketed me. My son's a great visual learner. He has a great memory ability. He struggles with writing. He has dysgraphia, so he can pass for any doctor with his signature. But we need you to work using the visualization. And she believed that I had those talents. And that's what caused me to have the self-efficiency to believe that I could draw it and then enter the contest. And then this quote I like a lot. Sometimes the most brilliant and intellectual minds do not shine in standardized tests because they do not have standardized minds. And this is a special education, the head of the United States in the 1990s who made that comment. And I was reminded of this when I went to grad school. They made us take a thing called Miller, Miller test. And I'd rather have a Miller beard in that test because it was very hard. And people would often do horrible normally on standardized tests because they're based on one thing that people would often don't have, recognition. They recognize the most famous of the answers and they go with. So question like this, which has the highest population? California or um, Los Angeles, New York, or Detroit? Most people would say New York because it's the most recognized city in the world. But if you ask those same people who got that right, what's the population of New York? I have no idea. I just know that New York's huge. Or Los Angeles, I have no idea. Even Detroit, when we live in Detroit, most people couldn't tell you. The autistic mind would think, what is the actual population? They wouldn't just go off 
that intuitiveness. We don't have that intuitiveness. So this holds back a lot of people who have some of the greatest gifts from being able to bring new technology, new abilities, because we don't shine in standardized tests. And Temple Grandin said it this way, if there were no people with autism in the world, you'd have everyone standing around the campfires, clapping, clapping their hands, hands saying kumbaya, kumbaya, having great, having great social, social skills, skills no, no technical, technical skills. skills. But a, but a dose, dose of autism, autism enables, enables a, a person, person like, like Thomas, Thomas Edison, Edison or Tesla, Tesla who turn on the lights. And, and I have a friend who has his PhD from Duke, and, and he, he had, had a job interview at Oakland University. University. He, he said, said this to me. He said, there's one reason I have my PhD and you don't, because I've helped you edit all your papers. You're very more intelligent than me. You have more articles published than me. I had about 150 at the time. I have over 200 articles published. This was only a few years ago. He said, but there's, the difference is this. When I take a standardized test, I recognize the answer, and I get it right. Even if I don't really know the answer, I have that recognition software. And that's, and that's where, where a lot of times, times we on the, the spectrum, spectrum don't, don't do good, good at academics. academics. It doesn't mean we're, we're not good and we don't have that knowledge. knowledge. We, we just don't have that audio knowledge where it's tech or it's the, the technical in that one area. We're very specific. What's interesting too is they could change this very easily. I'm getting a degree in theology. What's my standardized test on? Theology. And if we were specialized in autism, why wouldn't you make specialized tests for grad school based on specialized questions for that area? And then people with autism would thrive in them. In fact, we do better than them. And the answer is this. The SAT, the, the CEO of that private company that makes it makes 4.5 million a year. Why would you ever change that when you're making money? And until people advocate and say, People with autism, they're missing out on scholarship because the way you're doing education, we're not going to change it. So advocacy goes back to your marketing, that gift, that talent. Always look to a child to set the pace for learning. Look for signs of frustration, fatigue, and being overwhelmed. If you go at their speed, they'll be much more receptive to you, and you'll help them enjoy learning with you. So it's this. There's a word just to pose. So you begin with something easy. Think of it um, big or um, the whopper, your way right away, or your kid's way right away. So you begin with the bun, something easy. Then you get to the meat. That's Arby's. You got the meat in there. That's something hard. When it talks about meat, you always think of something hard. It's harder to chew meat than that bun. Then, then, once, once you, you get to some hard and you start getting a little, a little fatigue, a little frustrated when you're working, working, you go, go back, back to the bun. And then it makes them feel self efficiency. The belief that, hey, when I'm doing this, I'm actually, actually accomplishing things. And it, you can even use it in your own life. This is one of the things I do. When I do a small um, task in life, in life, I always say, I, always say, I got at least one thing one done thing today. Because then you then can build on that for bigger goals and goals. Number, Number four, four the cold, the cold the meaning, meaning behind, behind the behavior. behavior. Everything, Everything your kid, your kid does, does has, has a meaning for it, or they wouldn't, wouldn't be doing it. Doing. And, a lot, and times, a lot of times, kids with kids autism, autism, they have meltdown. They have meltdown. And the and thing is an, an, an ABA therapist, they ask is, what was the antecedent? What led up to the meltdown? What caused the meltdown? And how can we debrief after the meltdown when they're able to come to it? And there's a difference between, between a, meltdown a meltdown and a tantrum. And a tantrum. Tantrum, tantrum is I want it now and I want it my way. way. A meltdown is complete loss, loss of, control of, control of control of your ability. ability. It's, it's a, a complete, complete loss, loss of control of even being able to handle your body and your, your environment. And it's not something planned. And even kids who are not on the autism spectrum have their behavior. But there's a big difference when you see Michaela have an incident that's behavior and autism. Look at her face. How does she look? Guilty, right? Guilty is charged. Now remember Temple Grandin? Temple Grandin? Most, Most kids, kids with, autism, with autism, how do they look when they do something, something wrong? wrong? 
They don't, they don't look, look guilty. guilty. They got, they got that, that um, confused, confused um, um, lost, lost look. look. Even Temple Grand to this day has that confused, that confused look, look on her face, face when you're getting, getting a picture. Even when, when she's, she's up there giving her um, um, not, her presentation, she still has very little facial expression. And a lot of times kids with autism, they have very little ability with their um, inflection and their voice. They sound robotic. I remember the first girl I ever asked on a date when I was freshman in high school, she said, how come you sound like a transformer? So you know what? I thought I'd be cute. And I said, I'm more to meets the eyes. And I still didn't get a date with that girl. So behavior, even if it's a, it's, um, they're um, tearing up the place, has meaning. If you have very little ability to communicate, you know that when you knock things down, you got mom and dads or the therapist full attention. So learning to decode that behavior, learning the things in the environment that affect that behavior is very important. Behavior is affected by motivation, attitude, and self-image. Motivation thrives where there is love and acceptance. The most important thing you can do for your kid on the spectrum or grandkid on the spectrum is show love and acceptance. Let them know that they're loved unconditionally. And that's the most powerful motivation. That's something my family always had was a lot of love and belief. And then a child's behavior is like an iceberg. All you're seeing is him breaking that good china or, or kicking the door, or banging his head out of control. But there's feeling of love, feeling satisfied. Maybe they feel confused, attacked, feeling sad, unconnected. It can also be digestive issues um the the foods they're eating are affecting their behavior there's an old saying we are what we eat so a lot of times when i was younger before i started working out and running we went on a family vacation and if i didn't have protein every three hours i became dead weight and it turned out i had hypoglycemia and again with my brain processing information the brain regulates your insulin your brain regulates your blood pressure your brain regulates all these different things and if it's um operating different remember our brain operates different it can affect those things and even exercise can affect and we're very passive we have passivity which means our bodies adapt to their environment and even autism that as they start exercising the body can learn new ways of interacting with their environment. So exercise is very important. They found one study by Stanford, the sensory issues go down 25% by exercise. And when I started exercising, my social skills became better, not only because I was hanging out with the runners on the track team, but my brain actually started to regulate better. I started getting better sleep as I exercised. Because when you get done exercise, you feel tired. tired. And all those, those things, things can affect, can affect us. Us. Over 80% of the nervous, nervous system, system is involved, is involved in, in processing or organizing sensory input. input. And thus, thus the brain is primary sensory processing machine. machine. When our brain efficiently processes sensation, we respond automatically with adaptive responses that help us master our environment. Adaptive responses are actions or thoughts that help us meet new challenges and learn new lessons. What we call this is automatic Matic mode. mode. You're flying an airport or airplane. You airplane. get 40,000 40, feet in the air. I think, think that pilot's staying, staying there with his there back, with his back, back all, tight. all tight. Oh, he puts, oh, it, he puts in it in one. Automatic. automatic. And most, and most people, people in here, here you operate, operate in automatic. automatic. You're going, going home, home from work. work. All of a sudden, you know the no way home. Your brain goes in automatic. automatic. But then if a deer runs in front of you, you slam on the brake, and all of a sudden, you go from automatic to a manual. And the way that it's done is much like ABA. You have a clue. Driving home, you see the sights that you know. So your brain's automatically going into automatic mode. You have the behavior. When you see that clue, you behave based on it. When you come to a red light, you stop. The clue is a red light. The, um, when it turns green, the clue um, makes you realize when it turns green, the behavior, you drive. And you look both ways. And then the final one is behavior. So by, or I mean the reward. So you have the clue, the behavior, and then the reward is 
when you go in automatic, you can think about other things while you're driving and not have to um, um, be, be fully, fully focused focus on, on everything, everything going, on. going on. And then the and reward, then reward is, is what? what? You get home safe. safe. But with all a lot of times, we, we see things, things we can't generalize. And that's what I just talked about is a generalization, breaking, breaking things down. So we have difficulty with that, that and it affects our sensory processing issues. issues. And then I have my honey badger moments. I got my first honey badger on my honeymoon. We went to the Windy City of Chicago. And this was over 10 years ago. He growled at me. I growled back. I love it love first sight. sight. And the first, the first one I one got, got, when you press it, Paul, every, every F bomb in the book comes, comes out. And there's, and there's two, two reasons I don't bring that honey badger and I have locked up now. I got this one from Amazon. He's decalled. Number one reason. I don't want it to go off and you think I'm having a live demonstration of one of my meltdowns in the 80s or 90s. Number two reason is I wouldn't want my daughter to find that at seven years old and start, she'll be seven in March 20th, and start learning a bunch of new words and having to explain to her what those words mean. So I got this decawed one, but my hunting badger, I choose that because it's relentless. When your kid has a meltdown, it's relentless. Nothing seems to stop. And the best thing you can do is move everyone out of the way. Let them have the mouth down, They'll use up their energy. And when their energy is down, wait a couple hours later and then debrief. What was it that made this cause this meltdown? How did you have this? And honey badger is one of my favorite animals. So anyone ever see a mongoose kill a cobra? Mongoose is like this. And he, he bites it a couple of times and finally takes it down. Honey badger is totally different. He just keeps walking like Jason. And he's getting bit by that cobra and he just grabs it and bites that up. And you know what happens the next two days? Honey badger is um, intoxicated from that venom. It is actually just laying on the ground. And then when it wakes up, it eats the cobra as if nothing happened. And that's kind of how meltdowns are. We go full force and then the impact causes us to lose all energy and that later on after a kid has a meltdown for the next 24 hours they're going to be much more calm much more um labile fired most of you pay little attention to your sensory processing when you feel cold you put on a sweater when music is too loud you turn down the volume for me and many other people with all of them, our sensories provide unreliable information, causing great discomfort and anxiety. We, we on the spectrum, spectrum often experience sensory issues with touch, sound, taste, smell, or sight. And I call these our kryptonite. For me, my number one kryptonite is this. Boom, boom, boom. There's a song, it's all about the bass. You give me bass, I'm going to give you a can of whip. My other one is this, nail polish. I can't stand the smell of nail polish. So I get a migraine headache. I'll start being able not to think or process information. Oh, even in the winter, the winter when we had a poor had a vortex, vortex, and, it, and it, in 2015, 2015 my, wife my wife had to be, had out, to be there, out there putting on, putting on um, um, nail, nail polish, polish if she wanted to put it on and put it on at work. Could it, could it, literally, literally, I'll lose, lose all sense, sense of ability. ability. Most people's emotions and sensory issues, they're, they're like this. A lot of water, water. they get shaken up, stirred up. How much sap? The iron carbon made more like Mountain Dew. I get shaken up, kaboom! Anyone want to do the do? I'm carbonated neurologically different than other people. And realizing those things that cause that neurological meltdown is important. Yeah. My favorite honey badger moment happened when I was in fourth grade. I went to a uh, Cub Scout event where they had an uh, uh, red nose clown, red makeup, or red hair, white makeup. And the clown head was complete with this lamb puppet. My mom thought it'd be good for me to send front and center with 200 people there. And this clown knew nothing about autism, but very quickly he was going to become an expert on the autism language. He thought it'd be funny to take a hat off my head with the lamb puppet, put on another kid's head, and put it back on mine. He got off my head, put it on the other kid, and he's about to put it back, and shoo, I had that lamb puppet. 
and I proceed to beat the living snot out of that clown in front of 200 people. Aunt, Aunt Red Nose went on the floor. His makeup came off, and I went flying out of there. I flew like an eagle, yet I never got an eagle's badge, merit badge. I was aggressive like a wolf, but they didn't give me a wolf badge. I didn't even get a, even get bobcat, a bobcat badge, badge for God's, God's sake. sake. They need a new, a new one? one, the honey the badge. badge. And then and the next, next day, day, the Cub, Cub Scout leaders, leaders met with my, with parents, my parents and said, if your son, son would do that, do that to a clown, clown imagine, imagine what, what he'd do, do to one of our kids. kids. And I got officially kicked, kicked out of Cub, Cub Scouts of America. I'm seeing all these commercials where you abused by a Cub Scout leader. There may be monetary damages waiting for you. I'm not going to wait by that phone saying, well, you kicked out Cub Scouts because of autism. There may be some monetary reward waiting for you. That's not my um, 401k. Secret Santa, even things that are good for kids as when they're growing up can sometimes turn the other way. So when I was in third grade, we had Secret Santa. And the teacher warned the kid who had me is, the secret Santa, he was my secret Santa, he warned this, like I was a gremlin. Don't eat after 12 p.m. Don't get near water. Only they said this, don't give Ron any sugar. So I put my head down. I lift it up. First thing I see is Allison. She had a Snickers bar. Next I see Paul Phelan, and he has a candy bar. Then I look, and I have an apple. I took that apple. As hard as I could, smashed it. And I said, who the double hockey stick would give a kid an apple when everyone has candy? And I went running out of there. And you know what? That secret Santa wasn't secret because I saw Tim Denishu crying. And to this day, I still remember his name. So a lot of times, even things that are fun for kids, when you have autism, it can affect them. So one of the best things teacher can do is go to the expert you they would ask my mom they'd be like get have him get ron a toy or they would have um an accommodation for my not having sugar but they didn't do that and they got a not so secret santa and teach your kids how to rate their emotion and when they're real young what you want to do is use color Turquoise, you feel kind of peace. Mm -hmm. Red, you're a raging um, bull. One, I feel fine, nothing is bothering me. Two, I feel a little agitated, I can still handle myself. Three, I feel nervous on edge, my mind is beginning to raise thoughts with words. Four, I really upset and anxious, I'm losing control. By the time they get to a five, they want to be able to express it. It's total loss, meltdown. So it begins slower, but Sometimes one thing that smell of um, nail polish, that um, base can make them go from a one to a five quicker than a Lamborghini. If we learned how to market it, GM, Chrysler, and Ford, the speed of an autistic mind racing, we'd win every race car competition. The more you praise your child for what they are doing right, the less you have to criticize and discipline them doing wrong because praise becomes a motivator for proper behavior and realize the things that you can change the things you can't change you can't always change the environment and then one more thing one of the things they asked me when they interviewed me for travel on the spectrum is this they said well how did you learn how to control your um, um, emotions. Emotion. I, say, I this, say this, you can't, you can't control, control your emotions, your emotion, you can manage, manage it. it. And you manage, manage something, something by, by experience. experience. You get a, you get a rookie, rookie up from, from AAA, AAA and, and have play baseball, baseball in the big leagues, big leagues. probably not going to do, that, gonna that, do good. that good. But if you but manage being in the being big, in the big leagues, leagues for a while, now you now learn, you learn how, to how to control the environment and hit that home run on that fastball or that slider or Randy Johnson. You learn that. And, and one of the things one I thing said is my parents, parents always, always used, used exposure. exposure. When, when I got kicked out of Cub Scouts, Scouts they didn't say, well, well can't handle things, things like Cub Scouts. Scouts. We won't take, take them to any to events. Any events and then they got, then me, they involved got me involved in Indian, Indian guys. guys. After, After that, that, they got, they got me involved, involved in karate. karate. When I had my first meltdown in a movie theater, they didn't say, well, you can't handle the movie theater. I took my mom two hours to get me in the movie I saw the first time. 
it was a Maxwell Smart movie. And you younger people, Maxwell Smart is a voice of din, 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 din. go gadget go. Din, 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 din. Inspector Gadget. Only what happened when the movie began, there's this glove, the Maxwell Smart, and it got bigger and bigger and exploded. And I was go gadget go around that movie theater. My mom had to jump under things, try and catch me. And it took me two hours to handle my sensory processing from that loud noise and that experience. They didn't say, we're not gonna go to a movie anymore. Next week, I was there. Next week, I had a meltdown, but that hour and a half or two hours went down to an hour and a half. And after about 20 movies, I was sitting there eating popcorn. I knew that they had the highly um, rewards that I like. Then this one, number five, don't allow labels to limit your child. So what do you prefer to be called? Handicapped, disabled, or physically challenged? Joe would be fine. Most appropriate label usually is the one your parents have given them. So you don't want people to label your kid with autism. You said you want to market their ability. You want to focus on their strengths rather than their weaknesses. And autism, those weaknesses, they may all stay weak. But if you can make those ever so strong, then they can accommodate and adapt for their limitation. And most people do this automatically. I'm a good communicator. I make 40% of my living communicating. I work full time at a hospital. And at the hospital, I lead two groups every day and do communication. Now, I don't then look and say, I'm a horrible handyman, which I am. I am. Uh, and, say, uh, and say, well, I'll never, I'll never be, able be able to change, change oils, oils and, just and just keep driving, keep driving my car. My car. When, um, when the oil, oil goes bad, bad, I'll keep I'll driving keep it because I don't, I don't know how to change oil. oil. And then the car will start smoking after maybe 8,000 miles break, break down. down. I'll just buy a new one. Oh, I say this. My strength is my communication. I know every other Friday I'm going to get money. I'm going to take $50 out. And when I get to 3,000 miles or 4,000 or four months, I'm going to take it and I'm going to pay the $50 and get a change. So I use my strength to adapt my limitation and that helps me be successful. And a lot of times people with autism, they don't know how to do that. And that again is marketing, looking at the strengths. Kaylin George, whose son has autism shares, knowing someone's functioning label doesn't help you to know anything specific about them except for their ability to verbally speak. So it doesn't really help the mom at the party. The grocery store clerk or substitute teacher really understand your autistic child, what they're trying to understand. It's much more helpful to talk about an autistic child's individual strengths and struggles. They will give you a lot more helpful information in an arbitrary label given by a specialist somewhere that's maybe spent two hours with your child total. Also, also people, people who are considered lower functioning, functioning are often not given the same opportunities that others are given. Others are given. People hear, their, hear label, their label and almost give up on them before, before they have been given a shot. Remember, Remember my grandpa? grandpa life, life overlooked. overlooked. So, it's so it's important, important to know, know what the what strengths, strengths are, are, what the limitations, what limitations are, are, and what area, what area they, they need help. help. Because help, help is where accommodations are made. And that's, that's what my mom would always tell people. This is the areas my son struggles. I went to Sunday school. He struggles with sitting in a big group. Have a um, buddy person who can go out there when he gets um, rambunctious and take him to the gym. There's a young man named Brian, and he used to always take me out to the gym to um, when I got rambunctious at the church, and that helped me out. And these are different labels a lot of people put. How society sees us, an Einstein. Only 10% of people on the autism spectrum have a savant ability, and 90% of all savant abilities is calendar counting, where you give them a date, they'll tell you the exact day of the week it is. How our neurotypical friends see us, kind of Shelton, kind of out. How our parents see us, everyone's having fun and we're out there kind of in our own world. Remember, you got to go into your child's world and bring them out to your world. Um, how the media sees us, social interaction, not very fascinating. So we kind of see everything very logically. How we, we see, see ourselves. ourselves, a lot of times children, young adults with autism, they see it as, I miss my planet. They see themselves as being from somewhere else. Remember when I talked about my favorite book? Notice the title of it? 
no man's valley. And you know what it's about? Endangered species. The condor on the, on the front right there, there's very few of them. One of my favorite Chris Farley videos is one where they just released a condor in the wild and he's driving his little car and he hits the condor that they just let go in the wild. And you see him with a, a shovel trying to take the condor out and all these things. And then as he's driving up, you see the condor on the road. It says, um, the condor was just released. Hopefully it's doing well. But that's how I felt, like an endangered species, like that condor where there were very few of them left in the world. And that's because when I was diagnosed with autism in 1982, it was one in 10,000. Now it's one in every 44 children. And who knows when the CDC would change it. But how we really die? There's a good doctor. Professionals, parents, and my daughter's in there. There's my wife over there, Kristen. Well, we can accomplish these, the labels can hold us back. And Dana Coleman, she was on Love on the Spectrum. Remember her? She's one of my friends. She says, this English is my second language, autism is my first. What she means by this is autism affects every part of her life. When you have difficulty with language, you have difficulty understanding culture. When you have autism, you have difficulty understanding social interaction. Autism um, affects the way we speak. We have very little inflection in our voice. We're more robotic. So it affects every area of our life. And then the labels don't help. When I was a kid, people used to call me robotic or call me different things based on labels that they came up with. And Michael Bray, um, the coach at University of Notre Dame, when I was a keynote speaker there, said this, be a confidence builder. Encourage your kids to smile, enjoy themselves on the journey. So even kids with autism, they have very little facial expression, but if you can get them laughing, you get those muscles working. What happened when I started working out with weights? At first, I could only bench 60 pounds when I was in middle school. By the time I got to high school, I could bench 280 pounds. You know why? Because as you exercise and work out, those muscles become stronger. And if you can get your kids smiling, those muscles will start working. And there's that plasticity. Your brain starts new neural highways to work. And most people's brains aren't fully um, developed until 25 years old. So they got time to develop that smile. And like I have there with Coach Bray. I don't think he's smiling this smiling year, this though his year, team's not doing that good. Good. <laughs> Provide, Provide your children, children with choices. choices. And there's, there's Michaela, Michaela at age two, two cleaning, cleaning the house. house. And choices, choices are, are some of the most powerful, powerful things, things you can do, you can do to help, help your, your child develop new skills, skills develop social, social interaction. interaction. Austin, Austin John, John who's an artist with autism, says, says this. this. I know I that know the, choices the choices I make shape my life. Sometimes, Sometimes I choose to play video games, games on my phone when I'm in a group of people because it's easier than trying to talk or listen. When a bunch of people are talking, sometimes I go into my room when my parents have people over because it's better for me to play a video game or talk to just one person online. I do it because I don't have the confidence to sit in a conversation and try to figure it all out. It's easier to not have to worry about it. I know there are consequences when I make choices like this, but people might think I'm rude, not interested, or that I don't love them or care about them, but I do. So here's what happens with autism. Right now, when I'm speaking, you have the kids talking back there, right? You know what your brain does? You mute it. And we're using Zoom right now. So you know what you do when you have Zoom? You mute all the people who are in that group and you only talk to that one person. But again, we don't have recognition software and we don't have blockout software with autism. So all that stuff, we find it very difficult to block out. We can't just say, I'm gonna block that. So when he hears all these people talking, it's like um, Snoopy, wah, 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 wah. And it's very hard. In fact, when I talk to people, I have to have, to have them come right next to me and say, can you say it slow so I can process it? And you were the most famous person in the world, he's dead now, was for um, saying, can you say it slow? I can't process that is. 
And a lot of them, our history today and where we are today is based on this guy, Einstein. Einstein would always tell people, you got to come here. I can't understand you across the room. I'm hearing all these other things. So that's a sign that he probably was somewhere on the spectrum. The spectrum is Temple Grand said he needed a dose of, dose of autism, autism in the gene pool for higher technology. technology. Our play of today becomes our technology, technology of tomorrow. tomorrow. So, so with him, he can't block that out. So if you're trying to listen that strong, you use up a lot of energy. And it can um, cause you... And then he says this, making choices can be very scary. And it can leave me feeling unsteady and insecure. I want to live life to the fullest. And how can I do that? I have to have confidence in every aspect of my life. But that is not easy when you're on the spectrum. I often do things differently than the people around me. And they need to understand that that's just who I am. So a lot of times we do things differently. And it makes us unsure in our choices. That's why one of the things that helps a young adult with autism when they get older is a support team. People can share with them their life's experiences and help them better make decisions. Tom Sr. Tom Jr. What happens where there's no choices? We go back to that whole time. And I was reminded of this about four years ago, I went to get my hair cut. And there's a young adult, about 27 years old, going in to get his hair cut. And he had khaki pants on. He had a purple, white pole shirt. And it was 100 degrees. So most people would wear shorts to get their hair cut. We gave it away that he was on the autism spectrum as he was going like this, tapping. So I knew he had sensory issues. And he let the door slam on my wife and my daughter, Michaela's face when we were going in. So I knew there was something there. And then the dad was the polar opposite. He had cargo um, shorts on. He had an MSU jersey. He looked like a coach. And when they're getting their hair cut, Tom Sr. and Tom Jr., the barber asked Tom Jr. a simple question. Can I cut that little tail for me on the back of your neck? And it's about this one. Don't. No son of mine is going to have a rat's tail in the back of his neck. Cut that sucker off. And about three different times, he's barking at the haircut to make sure that rat tail doesn't come back. And when there is no choice, there's no motivation. I looked at the kid's face, and he was 27, and you could see how upset he was. You could see how the motivation was gone. So find easy ways for your kid to make choices, even in ABA therapy. They can say, we can do this activity or that, and they have the same outcome that creates motivation and kids with autism are never lack motivation in areas of special interest because that's a highly rewarded area for them number seven be interested in the passions of your children find out what interests them get into their world so you can bring them into your world and my interest i mentioned is a prairie dog and honey badger notice honey badger has a varsity jacket from the University of Notre Dame. So whenever I go and speak, I get my world tour of the honey badger and prairie dog, and I get outfits from in that area. I did a speaking engagement in Gettysburg, and I had them in the little Confederate outfit, the prairie dog, and had them on a rock in a battle scene, taking the picture, and I put it on there. Or the famous celebrities like um, Muhammad Ali, having to meet him. Dr. Barry M. Present, and he wrote the forward for my fourth book, Autism, Growth, and Transitioning in Adulthood. And he, his book, uh, Uniquely Human, A Different Way of Seeing Autism, is a top-selling book on autism all the time. Sold over a million copies. And I got to be on his podcast and got him to write the forward. Children with autism develop all kinds of enthusiasm, talking nonstop about it, focusing intimacy on Subjects like skyscrapers, animal species, geography, particular kinds of music, sunrise and sunsets, or turnpike exits. Perhaps focusing on one topic gives a child a sense of control, of predictability, and security in a world that can be unpredictable and scary. So that sense of security when I had prairie pup made me feel real secure. 
And when I was learning and having that prairie dog, it helped me be more open to learn. And um, if someone took away that prairie dog, I felt unpredictability. And I felt scared sometimes. sometimes. <clears throat> One of my One teachers, teachers described, described me this way. Me this way. Every, time Every time we see Ronnie, Ronnie has two has things, two in, his things in his hand. I'm left-handed, left so in my left hand, hand I have prairie, prairie dog. dog. In the right hand, hand I have a book. And those are the things, things in our hand, ultimately, ultimately are things in our heart. And those are where we're going to be accomplishing the great things that we accomplish. Clay Marzo. Mom noticed he was on the autism spectrum because he'd always line up seashells along the beach and his interest was surfing in water and they noticed that clay mars had very little ability to communicate outside the water he would stumble and fall a lot when he walked but you put him on a surfboard in the water and he he was amazing he's the only person, the only person in the world who can go up go on a wave and go backwards, go backwards in a wave and, and still keep his balance, keep his balance. But when but it comes when it to comes social, social skills, skills he's, he's lacking. lacking. So, so his mom, mom decided, I need a mentor for Clay. And she said, you know, you're the fourth best server in the world. You got six digit contract. I want you to meet Bill because he's got great social skills. You don't really connect. Remember I talked about connecting? So he knew the belief and his mom wanted him to market that with the surfing. His mom was big in him becoming that professional surfer because she learned how to market that gift. So comes back. The mom says, "Did you go to Bill's house?" Yeah. And Bill and um, Clay starts going up. You know, he's got, he's got all kinds of great stuff. He's got rock stars, a uh, um, sponsor. He's got all these new surfboards. He's got even Subway large amounts because he's representing Subway. Thank God they got rid of Jerry and got Bill the surfer. But she goes, "But he didn't tell me how Bill's doing." I had no idea. I knocked three times, no one answered. So I went in, I grabbed the rock star, grabbed the sub, ate the sub, had the rock star, checked out the surfboards and came home. So a lot of times, even with our special interests, we're gonna need a little extra nudging and a little extra mentoring using those to learn some of the social skills. Carl Bertensen, he built this Lego Titanic out of 65,000 Legos. And his marketer was his grandfather. His grandfather believed in him, saw he was good at working with Legos. He marketed him, got a bunch of people to donate thousands of Legos. His grandfather was a former engineer, worked with him, taught those, and he built this Titanic. And you know what it did by working with his special interests? Created communication. Listen to what he says. I was unable to communicate before I began work on the Lego Titanic model. My grandfather is an engineer, so he helped me as a, a lot in building. He taught me how long it would have to be, and he estimated the amount of bricks needed. Autism was just like a maze. You don't know the right way to behave with other people. That makes playing in a group pretty tricky. The fog is always controlling me. But when you talk more and more to people, what is talking more and more? Exposure. When you're exposing more and more people, you will get over the fog and you'll become a better citizen. That's because he's from Iceland. He uses a better citizen. Australia uses that better citizen. But his point is this, is that when you get using the passions of that person with autism, when you get them interacting with other people, skills are developed. There's a proverb that says, Proverbs 27, 17, is iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another man, or one person sharpens another person. So as you start working with people, refinement starts taking place. And that's what we see exposure does. Walker Arnold, he's um, the first division hockey player. And his stories in this book, I interviewed him and his family. His mom saw that he was behind in academic so she'd have him gear up his dad was a goalie as dad put on the outfit and then she cut out paper you have c a t she'd have him hit the puck that said c and the dad would hold it up a t what does that spell cat and they did that to teach him to spell and learn those social skills so they took that son's interest 
and use it to get them out in their world and educate. And amazing story. There's Armani Williams. There's me at his house in Gross Point. And his marketer and the person who believed him wasn't only his mom, it was his dad. His dad was a big NASCAR um, fan. Took him to ride um, goat carts. And when he came around, he said, this is what I'm born to do. And dad said, you know, he's doing good out there. How can I market it? And he started out small doing little um, truck races in Canada. And then he marketed it. And if anyone has a company, this is a guy you want to be your next um, sponsor, like a big subway or something like that. He's very articulate. He reminds me of a young Grant Hell, very um, dynamic, charismatic, um, carries himself very well. And he said this, tell me I can't so I can show you I can't. And the way you can show them they can is using those special interests, marketing those special interests, or leaving in them like his parents did. And there's some of the medals here early on, early on in the back. And, back. and then and then he also, he has, also the has the car. He shows his special, special interests, interest, autism, 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 and racing. And racing. And then the, the final, final one is this, this. Never, never give up. up. And I, I love, love this quote. quote. This is one of my, I've I have over 5,000 5, quotes memorized. And this is why my, my favorite, favorite all-time product. product. By perseverance, the snail reached the eye. Think about this, this way. How, how small a snail is, and it's going very slowly towards the eye. And I say it this way. Your kid could be as slow as a snail, but he's headed in the right direction. You're getting the right resources. You're marketing his gifts, his strength. You're believing him. He's going to reach that eye. He's going to reach that goal, and he's going to develop some self-efficiency. Believe that when I begin something, I can accomplish it. And there's a pastor, and he's driving on a dusty road on vacation in Alabama. And he sees this barn, and it's worn down. He sees an anxiety, or a, a cow that looks like it has um, eating health issues. He sees um, thorns and thistles, and he drives a mile up the road. He sees this beautiful red barn. And he gets out, and he's taking selfies, and then he sees a farmer pulling a weed. So he puts his arm on the farmer's shoulder, and he says this, man, God has really blessed you with this beautiful red barn. The farmer looks at him and chuckles and said, you should have seen it before God got here when it was just me working here. And helping your kid reach their full potential it takes more than just faith, hope. It takes dedication. It takes a lot of hard work. There are a lot of times I didn't look like this red barn, but I looked more like this worn down barn. There are a lot of times when I didn't look like the autistic celebrity on the back of my book. I look more like this than the, the, the picture you see red barn. So there's going to be a lot of times where you're going to have hard times like this. But over time, that fruit will develop. And my parents developed in me something called self-advocacy. There's me leading the state finals. In my junior year of high school, my relay team finished 12th in the state of Michigan for the 3,200 reel. I was one of the fastest 800-meter um, runners. And then on the way back from the track team, Nate Quay said, next year we'd be the fastest team relay team in the state of Michigan, but we won't have Ron on our relay team because I was three months past the age limit due to being held back in kindergarten. Right then I heard a voice in me, and I know it was God saying, I'll provide a way. And I said, I'm going to run on that track tonight. I don't know how it's going to happen, but God will provide a way. And things looked hopeless. My mom called all the lawyers. She called the Bernstein. Do you know what they said? I can't see this case. She called Lee. Said it won't be free. She called Mike, he said, I don't think I can win this. Figer had the best answer. He said, I'm having a few drinks on the highway. I'll get back. ACDC, I'm on a highway. But all parodies aside, they said the same thing. It would be over $40,000. My parents said, we can't afford this, but there's one thing we can do. Not give up. We can pray and trust in the higher powers hand. God. And the um, 
first week of the track scene, I came back from a five mile run. I was tired, I pulled out the newspaper because I always read the newspaper. And there on the front page was a young man named Craig Stan. He was born May, 1975, same month, same year. He was a track and cross country runner as I was, and he had a learning disability, but it wasn't autism. And my mom said, we're gonna call them and we're gonna meet with them. So we met with the Stan we family. And first words out of my mouth is, we're going to run on tech track team. God's going to provide a way. And my mom contacted Detroit News. It was a Wednesday. And um, they had me and Craig on the front page of the Detroit News that Wednesday after I had met him. And then that Sunday, I was getting water baptized. So my commitment to following after God and his call on my life. And when I came out of the water, I'll never forget what the pastor said to me. So I saw something when you came out of that water. I saw Joel 2.25. I repay the years that the locusts eat. The great locusts, the young locusts, the other locusts, the locusts swarm. There's something in your life that ate away from you. And I think it was a disability or something else. He didn't know offhand. And he said, but God said he's going to bless those years and he's going to give you a message. And I got home from um, the getting baptized. We had a thing that was kind of archaic back then. It was an answering machine. It was about this big, this high, and it's blinking red. And Thank goodness I didn't have to use my feet like the Flintstones to drive home, but that answer machine was blinking. So I pressed the button and up came the time of the phone call. What was amazing was the time, 9 a.m. It was right when I came out of that water. And it began this way. Hi, my name's Rick Glandel. I'm a young attorney. I just got my PhD from Boston College. I got my law degree from the University of Michigan, and I want to take your case pro bono. All I need is your signature. I went out, signed on, took our case, and then we won, and it became, I got to compete, got full ride for track and cross country. But the story doesn't end there. Remember I began by talking about, I interviewed 50 of the most influential people, people in the world, in the world who, um, who um, work in the autism, the autism spectrum. spectrum. One of the people, of the people I interviewed was Gary Marison. And in, and in fact, fact, this, this center, center here today, today all, all ABA, ABA centers, centers, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Gary Marison. Here's why. Gary, Gary Marison was a high-powered attorney out of New York. York. He, had he had two autistic kids. One, one was high functioning, functioning, which say Asperger's. Asperger's. The other one was, the other much, one was more much more low-functioning. Low function. And, um, and um, they, they had a, had a new, new thing. thing. This was in 1990, 1990 called ABA, ABA therapy. therapy. He was, he was excited, excited to get his kids in therapy right away because they said they were having groundbreaking results. Then, when he gets his kid in an ABA, he finds out no insurance is covered. So he calls his insurance company, and he has good insurance. He's a high-powered lawyer, and they say, we won't provide ABA therapy. It's not proven yet. So you don't have to provide ABA therapy for my kid. So you're going to provide ABA therapy, you and every other insurance company, for every parent who has a kid in autism spectrum in the United States. What did he do? Took cases. He goes to the Supreme Court. Takes another case of Supreme Court, more ABA therapy, more ABA therapy. In all, he had over 14 um, Supreme Court victories for ABA therapy. And now ABA therapy is a household name. When I interviewed him, he said this to me, Ron, I know who you are, and I'm going to tell you how you're going to end your book, A Parent's Guide to Autism. He says, you're going to share the story of Anthony Sturgo. In the story of Anthony is this, is um, he had a lot of um, issues because he was on the autism spectrum and he was in a foster home. And his parents wanted to adopt the kid to show that with love, respect, and faith, and faith anything is possible. possible. And they were and unable, they were to, unable have to have kids. kids. Ray, Ray and Ray, Ray and Ray, kind of like Raggedy Ray, Ann. 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 So, so when, when they, they go, go, they see they little, little Anthony going, going like, like this, this on a on couch. He took it that he wanted him to sit by him, but really he was doing it because of something called STEM. So they adopted him. And the foster home said, we never thought anyone would adopt little Anthony. He has severe autism. He has issues with meltdowns and IQ only of 50. The average IQ is 100. And they said, well, we believe there's a call and purpose on his life. And that, again, goes back to what? Belief. So dad tries to market him. He tries to find some interest. There's something that he's good at. Everything fails from baseball to soccer. When Anthony's 13 years old, he takes him to the Rutgers football game. And 
The game is tied. Rutgers gets the ball. They're in field goal position with three seconds left. And they're playing LSU. LSU loses, can't win the national championship. And this kicker, Jeremy Lin, does a repetitive behavior. Looks up, puts a finger up, goes three steps forward, one step back, kicks. Goes for the upright, they win. Anthony, all I can say is new special interest is football. I want to play football. I want to play football. Gad Markinson starts working with me. He's a horrible kicker. But after three years of dedication and going from that worn down barn, there's a red barn moment. He becomes a great kicker. The son competes his senior, his junior year. They have a losing record. He competes his senior year. They have a losing record. Now Anthony's in the state of New Jersey, they allow him to take one extra year of high school. So Anthony uses his favorite line, I want to play football, I want to play football. But the New Jersey High School Athletic Association tells him he's already had his four years of eligibility, They're not going to let him compete. And since he's 19, he's past the age. His dad calls Gary Marison. Gary Marison says, I'll look into it. Goes online to find a case, and he finds it. Sanderson versus MHSA, 1995. And he says, we're going to win this. And he takes my case, and he wins it. And God's doing something awesome in the background. He brings a star running back. He brings a great defense. Thank God he didn't bring Wayne Fonts. This wouldn't be a good ending. And Anthony finds himself using his repetitive behavior Three steps forward, one step back, kicks. And he kicks a field goal, a couple of field goals, and they win. And that's what advocacy is about. Marketing, belief, and seeing that the accommodations are met. And that's part of not giving up. And there's Haley Moss, the attorney with autism, very famous. And she says this, I'm a work in progress. I'm getting my goal a little at a time, not all at once. And for your kids, it's going to be little steps. Maybe like Anthony, where he was had severe meltdown, very um, considered a lower intelligence, but he went on to get a um, community college degree. Peter Wentz designing a video game. And in um, this book, I share Peter Wentz's story. He makes video games for hospitals. So he designs a game and Again, you know where I met him? When I was getting my hair cut. And the way I knew he was autistic is how he was sitting. He was sitting with his legs crossed. I can't even do it. It looked like a pretzel. And I saw how socially awkward he was. And I started talking to him. And I said, you know, my name's Ron. Um, and, and he got talking. And I heard the robotic sound. And then as we get to talking, I find out he's diagnosed with autism. I said, you know, you got an amazing story. I want to interview you. You're going to be in a nationally published book. So maybe when your kid's getting a haircut, they may end up in a nationally published book if they're at the great clips or super clips or whatever you call that clips. As long as they don't clip my ear off, I'm happy. And um, he says it this way. Peter shares, if I put my mind to something, it will get done. But the rest of my life all suffers. If I do work on a computer, I hire to get exercise. If I'm getting into a project, I let miscellaneous tasks fall through the cracks, like replying to emails or cleaning my apartment. So a lot of times with a kid with autism, they're going to have one single mind focus. And not giving up means to believe that as they're doing those things that interest them, as they're doing those things that you can market, other things are going to fall into place. And only 3% of people with autism are gainfully employed as I am. And this is how employment feels for people with autism. I hate my job. Oh, please. And that's another one, don't give up. If they're going through a season where they're underemployed, keep encouraging them. My dad would yell at me when I was 30 years old, how come you have your master's degree and you're working at Corky Skate Shop? Not realizing with autism and that economy at that time, it was hard to get work. And then ultimately, as you do those eight things, that young adult with autism is going to live the dream. And notice in the background, there's my daughter. 
on the stage. And good things happen when you're moving in the right direction and you know how to market your abilities, you know how you have people who believe in you, you have a support team. I was offered a job in Tampa as a motivational speaker and they offered me good money. But then I got the contract and there was red flags. You know, they were offering 75K a year. I couldn't make money on the side. I couldn't publish my own books. I'd have to do it for them. And my support team, within 24 hours of me having that contract, I already had three lawyers look it over for free. My friend Tom, my brother Steve, got it to his um, lawyer to look it over. Um, one of my coworkers already looked it over and they all said, these are red flags. I don't want to take it. And what's interesting is that when I talk about connections, part of living dream is connection. A uh, um, year later, I did a presentation at um, Bishop Foley for parents and only about 10 people showed up. One of the people who showed up and they didn't even know they looked over that contract was my brother Steve's lawyer. And she was so touched by that story and then she found out later on that she helped me out so a lot of it, the the connections that not giving up you're going to bless people they're going to bless you and then you're going to see how it comes together and it, how it helps your kid and then you're going to help other kids like my case wasn't about me it was about the anthony after me and now everyone in the state of michigan they can compete past the age limit. it wasn't about gary marison's kid getting ABA therapy is about your kids getting therapy. You knew that if they denied his kid, future kids would be denied and they miss out on all those opportunities. And then this is how I always in. Any fool can see an apple on a tree, but it takes vision and dedication to see an orchard in the apple seed. So don't just look at the natural things, your kid only being able to say a few syllables, but look, with eyes of faith, look with eyes of determination, look with eyes of love and acceptance and realize that with the right therapy, they're gonna be able to reach their full potential. And their full potential isn't necessary, they're gonna be that red bar and run. Their red bar may look different. Their red bar may be that they um, learn how to regulate their emotions so they're not biting everyone. So. The person working with them isn't saying, drawing cards. You worked with that kid last time. I don't want to work with him. You're going to work with him. It may be different. There's an old Fredder's ABC warehouse commercial. And they'd always play it right at um, Black Friday. It's, yeah, it's Black Friday. Yeah, the day after Thanksgiving. And the commercial was this. Guy has a broken arm. The other guy has a broken leg. Anyone remember this? And they're arguing about who's going to open up that door? And the one says, I'm not opening up that door. Last year, I got this broken arm. The other one's saying, last year, when I, or I just opened the door um, two years ago, and I got a broken leg, and it's still broken. And they're arguing about it because of the crowd that's going to come through. And when you can help your child develop even the most basic skills, communication, then they don't have to have a meltdown. And teach those things, then all of a sudden it's going to improve. So everyone's going to be different, their ability to develop and to see that and realize that. So any fool can see an apple on a tree, but it takes vision and dedication to see that orchard in the apple seed. And I want to encourage you, there's my dog Rudy and daughter, to get copies of my book, all the things I covered in here, they're in my books and much, much more. You'll hear about all these people and how they were able to figure out how to get their child out in there. And I always say this, the more you read, it may be just one little piece of information you get. That piece of information may be enough to open up great um, doors and highways. There's an old saying, um, if you have an eye and a needle and you can open it up more and you open it up enough, an army can march for you. And I want to encourage you. Thanks for having me come today. I'll be over there with copies of my books. If you have any questions, I think we may have we got a couple minutes for any questions and answers also. Any questions today? 
Brian, thank you so very much. Thanks, Mike. I haven't mentioned the way that's different with anybody, but I do have a question. Yeah, sure. So, you know, this is probably going back very, very far. Our, our son is four years old. Yeah. He is decent at being able to communicate, but speaks in just like a few words. You know, yeah. Stick it where he needs. And I'm just curious, you know, I, I'm always wondering what he's thinking. And yeah. I don't know. I can, I've never really seen anything or had an opportunity to ask somebody. You know, what are those? Are you still feeling like the same types of emotions or like a want to be able to, to communicate? Or is there like, is there some disconnect that, that story yeah. you talked about the fog was, was really interesting? Yeah. yeah. Where it's like the fog kind of takes over. Yeah. And, and I don't know where to go with it. And sometimes I wonder if that's kind of what my son's seeing. Yeah. So what your son's seeing is he wants to connect, he doesn't know how to connect. And when I was younger with autism, I do things that made me unable to connect. One of the things I remember is I had to stem a lot to be able to be in an environment. So my mom took me to this um, kindergarten event after school. When you had half day, they'd always have something special. And I had a cowboy's hat and I started spinning. And I wanted to interact with those other kids. But me spinning that cowboy hat by the string, kids were afraid of getting hit by it. And looking back now, over um, 40 years later, I can realize that um, I was doing that to feel like, make my body adjust to that situation, but the kids were all moving away from me. They didn't want to be around me. And I wanted them to be around me, but I couldn't do both things. So I think a lot of times when they're limited in communication, they really want those friendships. They really want to be accepted, but they're not getting that. And then they have all these other things like that anxiety, all the um, the the fog, and that there's moments where there's more clarity when they're in their zone with their special interests. And it's like even basketball players. Remember when um Michael Jordan had the flu and he's playing against the Utah Jazz and he got into his moment and every shot he took in that game, push. I think that's how autism is. There's moments where we're um, so engulfed in our special interest and um, the other people are interested in that we get in our zone and we can see things more clear. And then there's other times when we're um, kind of in our own fog. And even typical people have that moment in the zone. And with autism, there's a lot of fog. There's moments where it's less cloudy. Even like Michigan, where Sometimes it's cloudy. When you compare Michigan, I just talked to a patient a couple of days ago and he lived in Seattle. And he said, every day in Seattle, it's cold. You go on in Oregon, it's cold and cloudy. So with autism, much like different places you live, it's different for different kids. Some may have more cloudiness. They're more of a Seattle autistic. Some are more um, warm and um, chattery. They're more of a California autism. Some are very unpredictable. They're the Michigan autism. And it's different for each one. But being able to watch, observe, then comes understanding. And I think watching, observing the child is very important. And then also trying to teach them to communicate basic needs because when they can communicate basic needs, makes that aggression level go way down. And aggression, when they're little, it's cute. But when they get 300 pounds and they get aggressive, it becomes a whole other ball game. And that's why when they're young, you want to get them, ABA really works at that repetitive behavior, um, being able to use those things to help them develop enough skills that communicate that then they're not exploding, which is a communication you don't want. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about um, like trying to manage anxiety. Yeah. My question is about, I guess, the correlation then between like some of, and I know you can't speak for all kids, but it's like some of the um, correlation between sensitivity and what's what I'm looking for. Um, Sensory yeah, yeah, and anxiety. Yeah. And, 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 and see, the um, more 
you can get them in an environment where their sensory processing is on um, working properly, the more they're going to learn. If there's a lot of noises, a lot of sounds, it's going to affect them. So what you want to do too is that over time, expose them to different situations where they're going to have different types of sensory issues, and then they'll learn to adapt by exposure. There used to be a, a, a show and they use exposure there. And the person's afraid of snakes. And by the end of the show, they're throwing them in a pool filled with snakes. So they're afraid of heights. By the end of the show, with like little exposure to smaller things, they're walking across the San Francisco Bridge. And knowing how to adapt slowly will open up more doors. And the more environments a kid is um, exposed to, more their processing is able to adapt and learn plasticity. And plasticity is an ability to repair things. And that takes place the most from age one to age 25. So it's very important to get that therapy young so it can open up neural path, um, paths for handling sensory issues. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, I have a brother-in-law who was diagnosed in his 30s yeah. on the spectrum, and uh, we've, we've looked for many ways to try to help him because he did really good in his employment. Yeah. In his 20s and his 30s, he was very talented with computers, Yeah, and he got a new boss at work, and his routine was changed, and yeah. he lost the job. He Now I feel like... Um, he, the doctor even said he's going through what he described as an autistic burnout. Yeah. And I just wanted to kind of ask you about that. And it, I know a lot of that relates to what you talked about with anxiety, depression, yeah. and those types of things. Are so I actually have an article right down. Um, Ron Sanderson, um, overcoming the autistic burnout. So the number one reason a person with autism loses their job after five years in that job is to new management and moving to a supervisor position. That's why I talk about my fourth book on autism employment. I have a whole chapter on it. So one of the things that happens is when a person often get a new boss, that boss is unpredictable. They um, interpret their social awkwardness as either being uninterested or being rude. I one time got fired because um, this was, would have been 2002. I just got done with college. I was looking, I was working part time at a church and I was working full time at this company. And actually, it was right in Troy up on Big Beaver. And I was working doing telemarketing. And um, they had a meeting. And I'm sitting there and they're talking about something of, about the computer program we're selling. And the guy says, um, You guys look confused. It's like I'm teaching Greek. And I said, oh, Greek's easy to learn. I've um, been teaching it for years. And the guy thought I was being a smart ASS. So then they fired me the next day. But see, that might have could be something even real small like that. And it, um, the person doesn't understand you. They see your social awkwardness. And then or they take what you say as being um, racist, sexist, or um, feminist, I guess all the is at the end, and then they take it that you're rude. But it's, it has nothing to do with that. It's because the way you filter information is different because you don't know how to generalize it. Or you may generalize it's wrong to say this in this setting, but then you'll do it in that other setting. So what I, with him, I do is just encourage him, try and find another job, in it, and then encourage him to be an advocate. Say, you know, I do a great job in my work, but I'm going to sometimes say things that are awkward because I don't have that filtering shut software. And if it's the IT, say, you know, there's a lot of different um, types of computers. I'm the type of computer that's very efficient, gets a lot done, but I have very little um, software for interacting. It, company parties. I don't have much software for recognizing um, social clues. The 
hard drive I have has more information. It runs more smoothly than anything you have. And use that to market yourself. And again, it goes back to marketing and getting a job. The interviewer is looking at what? How you carry yourself, your confidence. And I think with him, that would help him out a lot. Yeah. So here's what I'd say. Let them know about their diagnosis for one reason. They already know they're different. Now, you gave a name for why they're different. If they just think they're different, they're going to think, I'm stupid. I'm a loser. Nobody likes me. If they know why they're different, they became an expert on why they're different. If um, you never told your kid they have um, diabetes, and now they're eating all kinds of sugar, and all of a sudden, they find out their blood sugar level is causing them to, to pass out. It's not helping them, but do it in a way that's positive. Haley Moss, remember the attorney? Her mom shared with her her diagnosis, and it's in my third book this way. You love Harry Potter. Like Harry Potter, you're different. You have special gifts. You're great at art. You're very articulate and able to... Um, share things in a way that you need. And your difference isn't that you're a, a um, mad, what's um, Harry Potter, a musician or a musician? Yeah. See, that's one of my, what? Wizard. Wizard, yeah, wizard is the way I use it. Wizard, but yours is your autism that makes you unique. So do it in a kind of playful, fun way. Yeah, psychiatrists seem to want to deal with autism with drugs. Yeah. What, what role do you use with drugs? So I, yeah. Sure. So Temple Grandin says it best. Is it since anxiety, you have 80% more high anxiety? The low, low, low dose of an anti anxiety is good, but to think that it's if it's neurological, it's not physical. Most pills are for what? Things that are physically wrong. And once you begin a medicine, whether it's um one for high cholesterol, one for hypertension, blood pressure, they'll almost never take you off. So it's better to try therapy rather than medication. You may need a little for anxiety, but there's a saying, Dr. Austin, I always like it. For every medicine, there's a little bit of poison in it. What he means by this is that there's no medicine you can pick off your shelf and then read it that says no side effects. But there are some things I take for my, I had high um, cholesterol and what I take for it. You know what it says on the back? Warning, absolutely nothing. You know why? Supplement. So I take red rice peas, um, and it's found on in the earth. And there's one scientist, and he said the worst thing about losing the rainforest isn't the amount of carbon dioxide you're gonna, or it's going to be for or loss of oxygen, carbon dioxide cycle. It's this: is it in every plant, in every there's some form of cure out there for everybody. The earth is made such a way, designed, created that for every disease, in one of the plants or somewhere out there, in one of the green things, there's a cure to it. And try and use natural supplements to help them out. They have digestive issues, look into some natural supplements that work for digestive. Because this natural supplements, you know what? Other than allergies, there's no warning on it of this happening. And that's what 
Um, very rarely will I ever get, um, I used to get the flu shot every year. And in the last three years, I haven't gotten it. Every year I got the flu shot, I end up getting the flu. I haven't had the flu shot in three years. And you know what's happened in the last three years? I've gotten the flu. And um, um, natural stuff is better because it, there's not so many side effects. Think of it this way. I want to make a shirt and say, just because there's a um, waterfall in the commercial doesn't mean there's no side effects. Any other question? So therapy works a lot better. What's interesting too, for mental health, what's the first thing they do now? I work at Haverwick Hospital. What's the first thing they do when someone gets in the hospital? They put them on medicine, right? And um, they've done study after study um, of people who do therapy um, for mental health and does um, medication, and they found the same, the results. So the less you can use a medicine, the better. More supplements, there's supplements I'm sure out there. Just call contact Joe Marion. He's BioTrust Nutrients, that's the name of this company. So uh, any other? I mentioned earlier, like actually, uh, my son was in age, right? he's a teenager, seven yeah. years old, diagnosed with ADHD, ODD, all the other acronyms you can think of. Yeah. DMD, this regulation. Yeah. And he said, a lot of, a lot of problems. So academically, cognitively, fair, yeah. I'm reaching a lot of things. He's in Harbor Oaks. So okay, yeah. So he'll be all I know Missy real when the CEO. And Ann oh. Ann Long. No, Ann Long's her CEO, and I know her well. And this is the um, director of the and I've been in Cape May, March, and 15 years. Wow. And I don't know how yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah, so he's in there right now, and he's mm -hmm. doing better now as we went in there for aggression. Yeah. And full aggression that found the yeah. grandpa on Cape, I guess. Hopefully, Austin Closer is the first in place to be real. I see that's when Tyson <laughs> needed aggression and severe anxiety. Yeah, yeah, he's got a little Yeah. So. We're just hoping that you know I, I we've been monitoring from home. It's been there about three weeks. We've gotten better each week. Yeah. Um, medications have been adjusted, so it's helped the teenager. Um, so I can't complain about that. As far as that goes, as far as he's in there now, well, when he gets home, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. But I'm sure. I think uh, hopefully, the holistic too. So yeah. Good. Fine line, yeah. It's a very fine line. It is a very fine line. Yeah. Like Temple Grand says, she's a little clonopin for anxiety. And she says it keeps her anxiety. Yeah. That's what they had. Uh, yeah. You get your brain even off the head. Yeah, and the head of it you don't want because it's highly addictive. They call it a PRN, as needed. Right. And if they That's use it, it's very addictive, very. Um, and then I, you, you see, see so, so many, many young kids every, every five, five minutes, minutes up there. there. I want my Ativan and I want my nicotine gum. Really? Yeah. Jeez. In that order. Yeah. One came and said, What do you have on tap right now? <laughs> like it's seasonal. <laughs> we got Blue Moon and we got Ativan on the ride. <laughs> they took them off that. They got them off that. They got off the Pronovan and they did replace it with the Go Up. Go Up. Yeah, and that's a common one. It's pretty known. But Ativan can be very yeah. addictive. Yeah. Anything that falls under benzos, you want to stay away from. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, there is very popular CBD oil for anxiety, depression. What do you think about this? So what I didn't hear. CBD oil. Um, I don't really know all the different ones. This is my advice. Talk to a doctor first, your primary doctor, and then if they give you the green light, try it. Because you never know what's going to work, what's not going to work. One kid may work with autism and be like, oh, this is a silver lining. And then another one, you try the same thing, it doesn't work. But you always want the um, primary doctor's green light because they've been to medical school. I've never been to medical school. school. I'm not an expert on medicine, I'm not an expert on supplements, but I know that if I ask them, they're going to be the expert. Whenever I Take anything. I always ask my 
primary doctor first and then find out. And then after they give me the green light, I try it and I keep track of do I see improvement? And again, ABA therapy, what do they do? Keep a stat of behaviors change because our sense of perception is not all a growth. But if you can look at the hard data, then you can know, is this working? So whenever you, whenever I take medicine, I look at the data of my own um, uh, cholesterol going down with red rice seeds. It's going down. And it could even be now I'm trying to eat more um, foods that's going to make it go up. So I got to be careful. So it's a little bit of each. Any other question? Yeah. What would be your experience with kids who are nonverbal and extremely active? Like my son is extremely active. Yeah. yeah. And it sucks that when it snows, it's yeah. really cold outside. I'm pecked. Because I can't go outside with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying to deal with them, and it's like I don't always know what to do. So, yeah. I mean, what? I mean, what? I don't know. Yeah. So what? I, what maybe would work? You have a dog? No. No a dog. Yeah. <laughs> Get a pet that's a little bit bigger. My dog Rudy. You wouldn't want him with a little kid because even my dog, she wants to hug him. And he gets um he'll get aggressive with kids on the you get a, a real mellow type dog like a lap or um well, golden retriever was yeah golden retriever and a little bit bigger and then um he'll let him play with them and then after a while that uses up a lot of energy playing with a dog and my dog Rudy every few minutes he wants me to throw that um bone or um throw his little um rabbit. So that can use up a lot of energy working with a kid. And um, I think that's one way. And then two, um, have a more calm environment. So that can, a lot of times kids with autism, they become like their environment. And if you can make it a more calm environment, it's gonna keep more of it calm. And then two, it can be nonverbal and make a lot more energy because it's hard for them to communicate their, environmental issues. For Michaela, my dad is um, partially deaf. He's um, legally blind. He's 88 years old. She comes in. And my dad, how do you think he has that Fox News on? Blaring. Um, Michaela's, there she is, see her running. How do you think she responds to grandpa's loud um, TV? What does she do? What? Louder. She, yeah. No, she covers her ears and says what? Yeah, too loud. What did my dad do? Turns it down. So even typical kids who are not autistic do not have sensory issues, but most have that ability to block it out. There's um there's a guy when I was in college, Logan, and um he'd always wake up with loud blaring Christian music. And he, when he went home on spring break, he got to turn it off. And for like an hour or two, you'd hear it blaring. And then finally, I found an RA to turn it off, go in his room, turn it off. But the first day, it was super loud. And then after that, it wasn't as loud because we learned to adjust to it. But when they're not verbal and they're autistic, their brain doesn't have that ability to adjust to it. Like the, um, Austin Jones, he wasn't able to. Shut this communication off, shut this one off, and talk to him. He had to use all his energy trying to listen to that person while it's blaring in the background. So finding ways to use the energy, I think a dog would be a good way. Um, maybe um, some toys that are, they can use a lot of energy when they use them. And, but it, again, it's hard raising a kid with autism. Remember I touch don't give up, number eight, because you're going to use up a lot of your energy. You're going to feel dead inside. And, and then two, it's a marathon, but the marathon, you can't get good rest for it because the kids keep you up. 
that they had to get Gelder masks. The flood came not because of people's wickedness, it was because in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the people were making too much noise. <laughs> and sometimes I think that's how it is when raising a kid with autism, you got all that noise and it uses up your energy. A lot of it. Are you familiar with the group study called, think it's called Mertz? No. What is it? It's like I saw it on online and I saw it on like on the doctors. It's like a brainwave treatment. Yeah. But and they they just now, at least the last year, year and a half, yeah. They started using it on people with autism. So here's my thing with anything to do with the brain. You don't want to mess around. We only know about five percent of the whole um amount of knowledge about the brain, if that. So why are you going to mess with stuff using electricity or other things and you don't know how it fully operates? And then one of the other things a lot of people don't realize is that the flu shot doesn't go in your RNA. Some of these new ones go in your RNA. And you know what your RNA is? Where your DNA is made. And the RNA in every animal species has something that we've never been able to, to um, accomplish 